In fact, I want you to do this. Grab your Bible, turn to the book of Esther, all right? Turn to the book of Esther. Hey, this is a great day, and happy Mother's Day, sure enough, uh, to all of our moms. Praise God for our moms. My mom is here today. I'm so hyped about that. And uh, I, I am such the advocate for women. It is an amazing time in history to be a woman right about now. And so today, what I want to do is look at one of my favorite stories in the Bible, uh, and it is Esther. I know times we look at, at uh, women in Scripture, and they seem kind of, you know, the Proverbs 31 woman is like, what? I mean, who really lives this way, right? Um, and so often we read Scripture, and it's kind of overwhelming. I know uh, we can have a mass confession now, maybe it's a good thing. Uh, there are no super moms, all right? Let's just lay that out there. They're just moms who love well and who are faithful uh, in, their, in their context in this moment. And so today, we're going to look at Esther. I wonder if you've looked or walked through this story. We're going to actually walk through the story. I'm going to highlight some things along the way. Some years ago, um, Mattel, the toy making company, uh, put together a G.I. Joe and a Barbie that could talk. You might remember these a long time ago. You could pull. It was kind of an innovative thing. Pull a string and they talked. Well, in one batch in the factory, true story, they got the voice boxes mixed up. And so uh, kids were pulling the string on a, you know, on, on a G.I. Joe. And he would say in a high falsetto voice, let's shop till we drop. You know, and, um, and then uh, Barbie was, was saying in this low guttural voice, she'd say, hit the ground now, hard, hard, hard. And, and kids were like, oh my gosh, what's going on now? Many years later, uh, this kind of gender confusion is, I mean, more than we could have ever imagined, right? And, and it's such a confusing time in our history as well. Uh, and yet the scriptures teach us clearly, what is it to be a woman? And today I want to talk, now I'm, I'm at a disadvantage because I'm not a woman, uh, but I've sought counsel in this message from women, and uh, I am a great, uh, I'm about to say lover of women, I, a lover of, <laughs> I'm a lover of, of a woman and women, um, but I'm an advocate always for women, and, and our church, man, we seek to be a place where women are raised up. Uh, in her book, The Power of Femininity, Michelle Hammond said that femininity, she says, is strength under control. She defines it like this. It's an inner quality that emanates from a woman who knows her calling and her value from the inside out. We've talked about this in recent days. Uh, in, from the inside out. All right. And so Esther is this woman who's beautiful on the outside, evidently. Um, and yet she has this militant fate that comes out from the inside. And what I want to do today is talk about the relationship between faith and courage, because she has this courageous, you know, Esther moment, if you know this story at all. And so um, as you're turning there to the book of Esther, we've been walking through, sure enough, we were, we've been walking through this series on David and um, talking about power. And today I want to talk about the power of love, all right, the power of love. In Acts 13, 36, it says of David that he served God's purpose in his generation, he died, and then he was buried. That's his epitaph. That's, that's for all of us. However, not all of us serve God's purpose in our generation. But li listen, friend, that is success in life. I was having a conversation this week. What is spiritual success? What is success to the disciple? It's being a faithful presence right where you are. That is success. And we're going to see that Esther was a faithful presence, a non-anxious presence in the midst of a tumultuous time. And we're going to see that she uh, was so courageous because, here it is, spoiler alert, this is where this is heading. Esther knew the blessed power of self-forgetfulness self -forgetfulness, and the freedom of self-denial. This is the ironic twist in the kingdom of God. This is where courage comes from. Now, to understand this story, this is going to be a lot of fun. I love this story. you got to know the characters of the story. So I'm just going to walk through each one. Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus is actually King Xerxes in the Greek is how you say his name. We know a lot about this king, by the way, the king of Persia. He is the king of the second great empire on the planet. First the Babylonians, then the Persians. Anybody know? 200 years later come the Greeks. In fact, the Persians and the Greeks are fighting it out throughout this time. And uh, it's Alexander the Great who actually then takes over the known world. Then come the Romans. 
the great Roman Empire, but this is the Persian Empire. And in 486 BC, he comes into this position as king. And, and the party begins in chapter one. The whole story begins with a party to end all parties. All right. In, in uh, verse one, you can see 180 days of the king displaying his wealth. And in verse five, ending this whole thing with a seven day open party for all. All the kingdom could come into the royal palace and party. And it's like an open bar party as well. Look at this synopsis in this cultural moment of, of Esther's time in chapter one, verse eight. It says, and drinking was according to this edict. There is no compulsion. And every man could do whatever he wants. In other words, there's no restraint. Everybody just do what you want. No boundaries. This sounds like a commentary on our culture, doesn't it? You do you. No boundaries. Have at it. Then the next character is introduced. Vashti the queen. And uh, the king wants her to parade around in front of him and all of his drunk friends. Vashti says, I don't think so. That's a little Hebrew translation. Um, she says, look at verse 12. Uh, but Queen Vashti refused to come to the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. Okay, so we're going to see this. There's a lot of messages being delivered and sent because you can't come in front of the king. At this king, uh, at this, the king was enraged. He's burned with anger. He's, he's just crazy furious. What's going on here? Toxic masculinity is the first thing going on here. But Vashti refuses to be objectified by men. She refuses to be an object, a, 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 a sexual object on display. I mean, this is the first heroine in the story. She says, no, I don't think so. And this is a good time, a good moment, women, to remind you and all our men here, you're not defined by your sex appeal. You're not defined, and I know a million messages that you'll hear today and see today tell you otherwise. You're not determined, your, your worth is not determined by your outward appearance. We saw this last week, 1 Samuel 16, 7, in the story of David. The Lord doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. He does not look as man sees, like we see or want to see. He looks at the heart. And Queen Vashti says, no way, I refuse to be an object for people to simply look at. Parents, listen, we must teach our children and at an early age, we've got to teach our women, our, our girls, and our boys to say, no, I will not be objectified. I will not be dishonored in any way. We've got to teach our children at a very early age what this looks like. But watch this. Don't miss this. Vashti's stand cost her. She's deposed from her royal position. Listen uncompromising holiness to live out God's better story of sex in our culture will go against the cultural norm. And, and here's what's happening. When we decide, look, we're not going to objectify women or any person because the objectification of people, that is to say you're an object, not a person. I can treat you as I want to. This is what pornography is all about. There's all kinds of evils that come out of this. Pornography, misogyny, racism, oppression of all kinds. But here's what I've learned. When you step into that space and seek social justice across the board, you're entering into a battle. Because there is an oppressor who wants to keep his or her position of privilege and power. And they don't want you to come against what they're seeking to, to own and to have as their own. But we're going to be a church that stands up for people who can't stand up for themselves. But we've got to teach our daughters and our sons at an early age. You are created by God. You're loved by God. No one will dishonor you. And yet we're challenged with that daily. So we see here the first of a series of ironic reversals. I'd call it a providential shift or switch. It's an unexpected exchange. Vashti is disposed or deposed so that Esther can become queen. Now, here's what's going on here. Don't miss this in this story here. These providential flips are the writer's way for you to enter into this story and say, do you see God at work behind the scenes? Can you track him? Do you see his hand at work? 
and then to embrace that in your own life. Do you live that way? When you think of your challenges today, you know, it's, well, it's that person's fault. And that, per, you know, if that person had made that decision and that, then that happened. Do you see God? Are you watching to see how he's at work in your life? Through the good and yes, through the bad. He can do all and work in all things. And that's what he's doing here in this story. It's so amazing. And so then in chapter, uh, let's see, chapter two, verse five, Mordecai is introduced. He's the uh, elder cousin of Esther who adopts Esther as his own. Her parents die and then he adopts her. And in, uh, let's see, chapter two, verse two, the king decides to find a new queen. So he holds a massive beauty contest, kind of the Miss Meads, Miss Persia beauty contest. And uh, this is the contest to end all contests. Um, there's a hundred and what it is, 127 provinces. Josephus tells us that there could have been, he's the great Jewish historian. He says there could have been 400 women in this thing. I mean, this puts Miss Universe to shame, right? This makes the bachelor look laughable, right? Not that it's not already laughable. <laughs> but, uh, and by the way, this is a good moment for our girls. Listen, women, girls, single girls. If your man watches The Bachelor, it's time to find another man. Okay, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, all right, just telling you, this, this is true. That was free, all right? Um, but, but look at this. Esther, the heroine, is introduced in chapter 2, verse 7. Adopted Jewish orphan who becomes queen, okay, <laughs> spoiler alert. And ultimately, she saves her people from this massive genocide, all right? So notice chapter 2, verse 8. Esther, watch this. Esther is taken, it says. From among the virgins to enter into this deal. So I know that we often read this story. It's like in a little children's Bible story. This is closer to sex trafficking than it is a beauty contest. This is what's happening in a godless nation. And we see it in our own. But, 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 but check this out. This is interesting. Each woman goes through 12 months of beauty treatments. Verse 12, six months of essential oils. I'm not making this up. And then it says, uh, then it says in, um, that for, for 12 months. Let me ask you this, ladies. How many of you have ever spent, let's say, 30 minutes getting ready for a date? Raise your hand if you spent 30. Unless you didn't like him at all, right? Okay. How many of you have ever spent, let's say, two hours getting ready for a date? Come on. Like prom or whatever else? Um, how many of you have ever spent more time getting ready for the date than you spent on the actual date itself? Anybody done this? We've done this. Okay. How many of you have spent 12 months getting ready for a date? I, I guess none of us. But, but this is what happens. And sure enough, in chapter 2, verse 17, Esther wins the heart or passion of the king and she becomes queen. Then, hang with me, chapter 2, verse 21. Mordecai overhears this plot of two guards who are plotting to kill the king. And he tells Esther, and the two guards are hanged in verse 23. Mordecai gets credit for saving the king, and it's written in the Chronicles of the King. Footnote that, if you know this story. In chapter 3, the villain's introduced. This is Haman, the prime minister. He's the nemesis of the Jews. He's a power-hungry egomaniac, if there ever was one. He's the architect of the mass genocide to wipe out the Jews. He's an Amalekite. They're the arch nemeses, ancient arch nemeses of the Jewish people. And, and in chapter 3, verse 2, uh, Mordecai will not worship. He's a Yahweh worshiper. He will not bow down to Haman, and it makes him crazy. In verse 5, filled with fury, it says. We begin to learn of this sad character. You know, I want us to just consider him for a moment. He's always adding things up. This is a kind of, of self-focus that is always asking, how do I look? How am I being regarded here? This is the opposite of Esther. It's the opposite of anyone who is in Christ. And yet we all struggle with this. Now watch this. There are two types of pride. All right. There's the pride of superiority. This would say I'm better than others. Now we we can we catch that one pretty quickly. We 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 don't want to be that way. We can see it in others. But watch this. There's the pride of inferiority as well. I must be accepted and approved. I must be applauded. I have the focus on me just as much as the other person. See, pride is always asking, how am I being regarded? 
And it can go both ways. What are others thinking about me? Both are a constant focus on the self. Look at this. Tim Keller writes this. Pride is always an endless ego calculation. Always asking, am I getting the respect and appreciation that I deserve? This is Haman. But this is many of us. I read this week, um, some of you know Descartes' famous cogito ergo sum, which is, um, I think, therefore I am, kind of a baseline of reality. Um, this sociologist was saying the new cogito is, I'm seen, therefore I am. I'm seen, therefore I'm somebody in this age of social media. How many likes do I have? How many? And we've got a whole generation that's being raised up in that, and it is constant. So don't miss this. This is a pride that is so insidious that it'll take you down. And many of us are more like Haman than we think. C.S. Lewis wrote this. Pride is absorption of self. A ruthless, sleepless, unsmiling concentration of the self. Pride is self-absorption. And watch this. It comes when we feel superior and when we feel inferior. It's why Lewis also stated, I love this, his famous quote you might have seen, Humility, the opposite of pride, is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's not thinking about yourself. Because thinking less of yourself leads to equal self-absorption and pride. So motherhood, gosh, the Christian life, demands a humility that doesn't think, watch this, more or less of itself. But your, your worth is defined by something outside of you, your performance, and how many people like you or approve of you. It's determined by Christ and what He has done for you. Listen, moms and all of us here, you need to hear this today. You are t- if you're in Christ, if you've received His grace, you're totally loved, fully accepted, totally pleasing to Him. That's who you are. And nothing else is added or taken away from that. So Haman finds out Mordecai is a Jew and he convinces the king to issue this massive genocide. It's a racist act of terrorism is what it is. And so then in chapter three, verse seven, if you're still tracking with me, Haman casts lots. He rolls a dice to nail down the exact and best time to, to, for this massacre to take place. And y'all watch this. The dice is called a purr, right? Tuck that away. And on the 13th of Adar, all Jews will die. This is confirmed and sealed by the king's signet ring, which is a twist in the story because then he cannot reverse a decree that he's made. And so watch this. Here's what happens. This is the Esther moment. Here's where we come to it. Mordecai and Esther say, we've got to figure out a plan. And here's what Mordecai says to Esther in chapter 4, verse 14. For if you keep silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place. He's saying it's going to happen, but you and your father's house will perish. They don't know she's a Jew yet. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You may have heard that phrase. For such a time as this. And here's what I want to encourage you with today, friends. Listen, this is you. This is not just a colloquialism. This is not a cliche. I want you to understand this. I want every mom to understand this today. But every person here. You are placed in your position, your place, your spot, right where you are for such a time as this. To be God's faithful presence, right where you are. Then I want you to consider, where am I? Who are the people who are under my influence in these days? God has put you there. This is your Esther moment. If not you, then whom? If, if you're not going to share the love of Christ with this person, who is going to do it? If you're not going to forgive, who's going to forgive? Mom, listen, mothers of newborns, babies all around the house maybe, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. This is true. And listen, the greatest thing you may do for God, how about this? It may not be something you do, but someone you raise. This is true for every parent here. Don't underestimate your Esther moment. The power in this moment. Don't underestimate your influence in the midst of dirty diapers. In the midst of mounds of laundry. Of of juggling busy schedules. Ungrateful kids and husbands. And you continue to be faithful. 
Continue to be faithful right where you are. You be his faithful presence right where you are. Don't give up. So here's what Esther says in chapter 4, verse 16. Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa. That's where they are in the capital city. And, and, and hold a fast on my behalf. They're going to pray and fast. And she's going to gather. I'm going to gather all my girlfriends. And we're going to come together. And by the way, girls, we need girls. Women, you need each other. We don't need to compete. We need to encourage each other. And this is what, the, what we do in the church. Then I will go to the king. And though it is against the law, if I perish, I perish. This is her moment. If I die, I die. Now, I know what a lot of us are thinking. You're thinking, well, hey, I don't think I'm going to be saving nations today. I don't know if this week I'm going to be asked to give my life and die. Watch this. We've all been called to live that way. I've seen it in my mom. I've seen it in Stacy. I've seen it in women's lives. Where they say, I will die to myself to serve my kids in this moment. But he's called all of us to live this way. This is your Esther moment. And I want to say this to our single women in particular and men. But women, listen, don't define your worth by whether you're dateable or whether some guy thinks you're something, just some sinful goofball just like you is going to determine your worth and your value. It's determined by Christ and what he's done for you. And don't miss that today. I know this is a tender day for a lot of people who are wrestling with a lot of things around motherhood. We say it all the time. Grief is the price we pay for love. There's no greater love than the love of mom. So there's no greater grief. And it's why we must define ourselves by the way that God has defined us, by His great love. Are you a faithful presence right where you are? Watch this. Another ironic reversal. In chapter 5, at a private banquet, Esther announces she's going to have an exclusive banquet. She didn't feel it was time to offer her challenge. It's interesting there because of what happens next. But she says, I'm going to have an exclusive banquet, banquet with Haman uh, and the king. Haman's invited to this exclusive banquet with the king and queen. He freaks out. And then he sees Mordecai in chapter 5, verse 13. And he just goes crazy. He still is not bowing down to him. He won't honor him. Yet all this is worth nothing to me, he says, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Here again, we see the danger of, of a, an approval-based self-esteem or identity. So what's the cure? All right, listen to this. Haman is so enraged that he builds these gallows, giant gallows for Mordecai to die on the next day. And then here's what happens. Watch this. The story pivots again. Chapter uh, 6, verse 1. The king can't sleep. And so he says, hey, read that book, The Chronicles of the King. Read that book about me. I like that book about me. Read that book. So they read the book, and providentially, they read the story of Mordecai saving the king's life some years earlier. And he says, hey, what's been done for this guy? And they say, nothing's been done. So Mordecai shows up at work the next day into the palace, chapter 6, verse 6. And he says, hey, hey, Haman, what should be done for the man in whom the king delights? Mordecai, all, I mean, Haman, thinking about himself all the time, thinks he's talking about him. He says, I'll tell you what to do. Put a royal robe on him. That would be amazing. Put a royal crown on his head. Get him on the royal horse. Cart him around the kingdom so everybody can see how awesome uh, he is. But watch this. Here's what Haman's doing. Haman, see, here's the deal. For the king to put his robe on someone is not simply honoring them. Watch this. He's saying, I love this person. It's what was generally done from king to prince. It was done from a father to a son. I love him. And I not only honor him, but I'm loving this person. Okay? And so he, he, what he's doing here, he, he's asking what we all are asking for. Haman is thinking, if I can be loved by the greatest one, then I'll be loved. Because that's where this goes, this constant need to be loved. i, I got to be loved by everyone. And the greatest one, if they would love me, if I get enough likes, if I have that person like me, all these other people like me, but if that person like me, then I would be someone. Some of us live this way. Haman knew what we all know. He wanted to be loved by the greatest one. He's not asking the wrong thing. He's asking the wrong king is what we're seeing. Watch this. 
J.R. Tolkien wrote this in The Two Towers. He wrote this. The praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. This is what Haman knows. He's asking the right thing. He's just going to the wrong king. And so here's what happens. The king says, Haman, that's a great idea. Go get my man Mordecai. He says, what? I think he said that. Probably like that. And, and so Haman carts him around. He's the one who does all this. So Haman in his pride is brought low. Mordecai in his humility is exalted and raised up. That is the principle of the kingdom. In every one of our lives. Then at this second banquet in chapter 7, Esther reveals she's a Jew in chapter 4. I mean verse 4. Exposes Haman's plot to kill them all. And then he is hanged on the very gallows prepared for Mordecai. And then here it is. Chapter 8 verse 3. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. This is her defining moment. Now, before we go, I want us to consider this. Where did her courage come from? Listen to this. This is like the, pro, the pleasure principle. Paradox of hedonism is what it's called. You don't get pleasure by pursuing pleasure. You don't get peace by pursuing peace. You don't get courage by pursuing courage. You get courage by pursuing something else. Someone else. This is the key to Esther's courage, and it's the key to our courage. 1 John 4.18, it says, there's no, no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. What is this? Watch this. Perfect love produces courage. If I'm driven by God's love for me, right? Not my love for Him, but His love for me, then I can, watch this. How about this? Courage is love on fleek, is what it is. Courage is love uh, it's, it's what Thomas Chalmers, the great 1800s Scottish preacher, he called it the power of a new affection. I love that. Christ and the gospel. You're going to desire something. You're going to pursue something. So here's, my, here's my, really the center of this message. We must be captured by the explosive power of a new affection and driven by a greater love. That's our problem. That new affection is Christ Himself. This is the power of self-forgetfulness. This is the power of love. If you live your life for Christ, you can love others without any love in return. You can forgive others. So watch this. To end the story, the king commissions Mordecai to issue a decree that if anyone tries to kill them, then they can now retaliate. And they do. And so there's this great celebration in chapter 9, verse 6. It's called the Feast of Purim, taken after Pur, the dice that Haman rolled to exact the day. Now the dice meant to kill becomes a symbol of God's rescue of his people. I love that. This is just an amazing story. All of this points then to the greatest exchange of all. Philippians 2, Paul says, Christ, the great King of Kings, comes from the very top all the way down to where we are. He takes off his royal robes. He becomes a man. He walks among us. Not only a man, he is humiliated. He's brought low. He dies. Not only a death, he dies on the cross as a criminal so that you and I may humble ourselves before him, receive his grace, give our lives to him because he has paid the price for us. And the praiseworthy of the highest one, Paul goes on to say, because he died and was raised again, God has exalted him to the highest place. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Friends, listen, you can declare, you can declare him Lord now or you will later when it's too late. There is no forgiveness apart from Christ. You're still under the wrath of God if you've not received His grace, His death, His exchange for you on the cross. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, for our sake, right? Our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The highest one. Our great king takes off his robe. He covers us 
with the robe of His righteousness so that we are accepted, fully known, and yet fully loved by the only one who matters, the greatest one. So you may have come here on this Mother's Day to honor mom. Mom drug you here because it's Mother's Day. We are here because we want to exalt Jesus as our great king. This day can change your life. Let me ask you, have you received his grace? Is there a moment where you said, I received by faith what Christ has done for me? If not, you're still under the wrath of God. And you are, you're living like Haman. And let me just ask you, friends, listen, aren't you exhausted? Aren't you just exhausted? The Lord has called you here today to find rest in Him. Let's pray together. Lord, I ask that you would now speak into every heart. And friend, before we leave, and maybe Mother's Day brunch or lunch, whatever you've got, do business with God right now. Every one of us. Let's pause. Die to yourself. Give your life fully to Him. If you've not received His grace, do so now by faith. Not by works. Praise Him. By faith, Lord, come into my heart. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for the greatest exchange, the greatest providential switch, flip of all time. The cross meant to kill becomes our victory. Becomes my salvation. I praise you for it. All I can do is respond by worshiping you with my life. Lord, we love you. We give you our lives. And we thank you that you are our great king who loves us so. This is the power of love. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.